jaw stops tightening and going sideways. Uh -huh. A little while ago I was fine, you know, but now I'm starting to leave again. Does it hurt? My back right now hurts, and the jaw and the whole neck starts hurting. This is a man who came in complaining of involuntary muscle spasms. He was not a psychiatric patient. After extensive questioning, initially which, during which he had denied taking any medicine whatsoever, he admitted that he took a medicine, but didn't know what it was, and he had taken it from his girlfriend, assuming it would help actually his low back pain. Are you are you in my pain back, right now? Yeah, yeah, my, my back. Yeah, my back spasms. Back spasms twisting, you know, like with the jaw. Same movement. Okay. He was having recurrent spasms, and the spells would last about 20, 30 minutes at a time. Now, right now, in your face, are you? I'm smiling because I can't help it. You're smiling because you can't I'm help it. I'm because I'm smiling. I'm smiling. Nice. My teeth is leaving me again. Okay. That's what's happening now. Huh. And how long are each, is each episode lasting? It's been about a half hour ago. I was, I was fine. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And now it's starting to come back again. Okay. Could you it's unusual to have a generalized acute dystonic reaction. <laughs> you want to lie down? That's okay. Most dystonic reactions are from the neck and above. And they usually involve the That's jaw, the tongue, the head turned to one side. Can you move your leg? Can you bend it at the knee? No, no, no. You can't bend it. Not yet. But his dystonic reaction involved his spinal musculature, his leg, and interestingly was asymmetric. That's one of the many things about acute dystonia we don't understand. Since your brain is presumably symmetric, why should this sometimes involve one part and not the other? And sometimes it may jump from one side to the other side. Why should it spare one place and not the other? Here he's trying to walk, and you can see the severe torticollis. Okay, now turn around and look at me. Is your neck twisted? Mm-hmm. Just stay like that, just stay right there. Look at his tongue. That's involuntary that his tongue is stuck out. I can, I twist it back. Can you overcome it if you take your hand and push on your chin? We're asking him at this point whether he has what we call a geste antagonist. Patients with dystonia frequently are able to overcome the dystonia just with mild touching. They're not really pushing their heads over. Oh, hey, they heard me talk a lot. This is great. In the emergency rooms, it's the nurses who see most of these things, and they're easily recognized. So you see a patient who comes in who's just received Haldol, and their eyes are up like this, and you talk to them, and as they're talking to you, their eyes come down, and then they drift back up again, and they look like this. If you've never seen that before and hadn't read about it, the first thought, I think, has got to be that this is part of their psychosis, in which case, of course, you may be tempted to treat it with more drug that caused it in the first place. So I think the main differential there is psychogenic. And then in about two, three minutes, yeah, that's you'll be all up. better. Okay? Okay. Okay. Try not to jump. It uh -huh. doesn't hurt much to go in. So they'll have a flurry of uh, episodes of these things until they're given intravenous diphenhydramine or intravenous benztropine or diazepam and they go away within a few minutes of getting the drug. And you feel normal? Uh, not, not all the way. Not and they're virtually 100% curable with these drugs. And in what, what way are you not normal? I still feel, my, just feel pain in my neck, that's it. Okay, but that's like it's, it. Like it's really stiff. So he was treated with Benadryl, diphenhydramine, and it went away, and he got put on Benadryl for a few days, and it never came back. Can you open your mouth, close it again? Can you tell me what you're experiencing right now? I'm anxious. I can't, well, I can stop my legs if I concentrate. Um, can you describe, is, do you feel any uncomfortable sensation in your legs? It's only uncomfortable, it's not painful. 
It's uncomfortable. Yes. Can you use any descriptive terms for people you know, who are looking at this? Do you feel restless? Yes, I feel restless. Do you get relief by moving around? Yes. Now, could you stand and not move? I can try. Okay. Oh. I'm standing on one leg. That makes it easier, huh? Yes. Are you moving your toes inside your shoes? Yes. Okay. On a scale of 1 to 10, how uncomfortable would you say this is? 7. And what was it before? 9 or 10. Okay. As now, far as just uncomfortable, not painful. Now here's a difficult, maybe impossible question to answer. How would you compare the discomfort from this, maybe when it was a 9 or 10, compared to the discomfort of uh, the psychiatric illness itself? Oh, way above. Which was, which was worse for you? This. This was worse for you than actually having the psychiatric disorder? Yes. So you would say that you would rather have been untreated yes. than to have your thoughts under control but your body this uncomfortable? Yes. Now, in general, akathisia is described by the patient as a body restlessness, not a mental restlessness. So patients will describe the worst restlessness is occurring either on their thighs or on their abdomen. I, so I ask them to point to where it is the worst. And if they point here or here, it's more likely to be akathisia. If they point to their head or can't describe it, somewhat less likely to be akathisia. If you had to rate it on a scale of 1 to 10, how much would you rate it? Uh, I'd say 8. About an 8. Yeah. Do you sometimes get a 10? Yeah. So this isn't as bad as it can be? Okay. The worst disasters that I've seen from akathisia are disasters like suicide. A completed suicide is obviously a tragedy, especially when it happens from a preventable or reversible side effect such as akathisia. After a while, it drives you crazy. It's driving you crazy, these movements? Yeah. In my 20 years as a consultant, I've seen maybe five cases of what I believe to be akathisia-induced suicide. And there's been a common theme in those suicide that I'd like to warn clinicians of. The first thing is the akathisia is severe. The second thing that I've seen in all cases, it's undiagnosed, and the antipsychotic is raised or continued. And then the third thing that I think is most important in these disasters is the patient doesn't know what's happening to them. They're not given a diagnosis. They're not reassured it's a side effect. So they feel overwhelmed, they feel like they're losing their mind, they feel desperate, they don't know what's happening, and they seem to suicide out of desperation of feeling horrible and not knowing what's happening and feeling desperate. So a very important part of managing akathisia is to identify the fact that it is a side effect for the patient, reassure the patient it will go away, it's horrible but it will go away, there's treatment or we can change medicines, or something. That then decreases the terror of the patient feeling like this horrible thing is happening to their body and they don't know what's happening. It's hard. It's hard for the family too, I guess, you know. Not just not just the one that's having it, but the person that has this is really going through hell. Um, I can understand when people say that uh, someone committed suicide. I can understand how they felt because at one time I felt that way too. But now if I get depressed, I don't get depressed nowhere near that as much as I used to. The things that I think get missed most in the psychiatric population are the slowness and the change in their walking and their posture. Most okay, schizophrenic patients now. who are treated okay. with neuroleptics don't have significant walking problems or balance problems. 
even though you may see that they're a little bit stooped and they don't swing their arms so much. Try not to lose your balance. And they may be a little slow, but it doesn't really interfere with their activities all that much. But I'm going to do it harder. And in a sense, you can understand it. If their psychosis is under control and the patient's not complaining about something, terrific. You know, leave well enough alone. You know, why rock the boat? But I think there's a lot of Parkinsonism that goes on uh, that's just not recognized. Or if it is recognized, people say, well, that's the price you have to pay in order to get adequate psychosis control. Do you ever have tremors? Do you ever notice that you shake? Yes. My thighs you? shake a lot and my, yeah. and my fingers shake a lot. Okay, does that bother you much? The other problem is that they're often not able to uh, supply history. A, a little bit. They often tolerate drug side effects because they've lived with them for 20 or 30 years. And I think they probably just shrug their shoulders and say, this is part of what's wrong with me. Plus, they've been treated for so long, and the development of these things may be so gradual that they don't perceive them. You take a drug, and all of a sudden your head twists like this. You know about it. You say it's the drug. Very clearly identified. But you develop Parkinsonism, which develops over days, weeks, or months, and people don't know it. They notice when they have a tremor. So if their hand's going like this, they'll say, oh, yeah, I shake, it's from my medicines. But if they're like this, and they move slowly, you know, or their balance is a bit off, they won't recognize that, and frequently their doctors don't either. They all recognize the tremor. But beyond that, they frequently don't identify the other things, the stooped posture, the absence of arm swing, and the bradykinesia. Those often go unrecognized. Now, with the right hand, go like this. This fellow has facial masking. Can you hold it sideways now? There you go. He has diminished, I mean, this, he's not much older than me, and that would be normal. And the left hand, you can see he's very, very Brady kinetic. Okay, put your hands down. Up and down, the whole leg up and down. He's tapping his leg up and down, and he should be able to get a much, much higher amplitude and better speed than he's generating right now. So these are manifestations of his bradykinesia. Careful with your head. I want you to come out in the car. Now, psychiatric patients can be visibly affected by their antipsychotic treatment. And I don't want my patients to look like they're on antipsychotic medications. We talked about your concern about the medicines you were on, that you would look medicated in these interviews. Could yes. you tell me about that? What's the concern about that? I am afraid that I am not expressing a full range of emotions, that I look kind of rigid, that I look kind of medicated, mm -hmm. and that people can tell that there's something wrong with me, mm -hmm. you know, just by observing me. What is One of the terrible you? things about EPS sort it of, is that it uh, brands you as being on medication. Well. It's kind of an, an unemotional quality about it, you know, a lack of animation. And the meaning of EPS General. is that they're visibly stigmatized uh, by the side effect. This person on medication. Right. Just imagine what compliance to AIDS medication would be if you took a protease inhibitor that gave you some sort of physical side effect that made everyone know that you're on a protease inhibitor for your AIDS. I mean, think about that. You had an honorable discharge before your psychiatric problems developed. My, to my feet. You had two left feet. When, when, when they made that last parade, parade in front of the generals and admirals, and I wasn't there. Okay. And you think that, <coughs> that was because your psychiatric problems were beginning then? Yeah, because the the marching, I couldn't march. You couldn't march because of two left feet. What does that have to do with any mental illness? <clears throat> the feet connected to the knee bone. The knee bone connected to the thigh bone. And that's all connected to your brain. Yeah. Is that right? I see. Okay. Okay. Tardive dyskinesia 
is okay. of very serious concern because of the threat to good. the patient that it can be permanent. All of the other side effects are reversible, but the threat to tardive dyskinesia is its potential irreversibility. Yeah, the, the irony is that while on one level it's the most serious, on another level it's one of the least problematic on a day-to-day -day basis because tardive dyskinesia for most patients tends to be mild and not distressing, whereas Parkinsonism and akathisia tend to be very distressing. Keep your mouth open. Okay, that's fine. I don't have much strength in this yeah. With the choreic disorders, the constant random kind of movements, patients either are unaware or underestimate how bad their movement disorders are. Whereas patients with tardive dystonia are very much aware of their syndrome. Turn sideways to me. That's right. No, that's perfect. Dorothy has these involuntary movements of her arms, particularly her left arm. But the major problem here was the arm and the axial dystonia so that she's leaning backwards. Just going by itself, huh? Can you hold your hands out in front of you? Both hands? During this entire time, her psychosis was completely controlled. But they weren't able to find any other medications that could treat her. And she was intolerant of reserpine that induced a severe depression. She was placed on clozapine, which actually did nothing at all for her movement disorder. And the rationale for using clozapine was to allow this passive healing business and also hopefully to treat the tardive dystonia, but it really didn't treat the tardive dystonia. But when we added reserpine, she was able to tolerate it this time, and she became dramatically, dramatically better. Go like this. So this is, I think, a year or two later. You tap your foot. And the other one. I think the notice is look at her left arm. Look at her posture. Look at her head. Can you sit forward in the chair? Now, you will see that she's a little Parkinsonian but it was a price she was willing to pay because she was so much more comfortable. In other words, she's not normal now, but she's so much closer to normal that even though she's a little bit further in the direction of towards Parkinsonism, I mean, this is dramatic, dramatic yeah, to the right. benefit. To the right. yeah, to the this right. is why people like going to movement disorders. You have the occasional patient who you can improve so much. And this is control. She wasn't cured because eight years later, she if still has this movement you. disorder, and when her drugs were again. adjusted, she's got it back again. Turn around again. It's like agony. It's just like you're, um, well, you're shaking all the time. You can't sit down. Um, then they gave me the shots for my neck and made it worse. I kept turning more and more. And it's just like, uh, let's say you're walking on a hot sand on the beach and you couldn't get to the cool sand. And you like that for about uh, 20 minutes. By the time you get to the cool sand, you're relieved. Finally, I can breathe. And that's about what it is to get relief from tardive dyskinesia. Because you shake and uh, uh, you can't sit down. Uh, it's just complete discomfort. So what do I do if I see mild tardive dyskinesia? on a patient who's on maintenance antipsychotics. The first thing I do is not panic. Some of the biggest disasters I've seen in my practice, or as a consultant, it is mild TD, the, the patient panics, the doctor panics, the patient goes off medicine, there's a relapse, there's a suicide, or whatever. So the first thing I want to reassure the patient and myself is don't panic. Now I want to take your right hand and touch each finger with your thumb. We found that go. once you develop tardive dyskinesia, it. it doesn't mean it's going to get worse. It doesn't mean it's going to evolve yeah, into some thing. really excruciatingly terrible syndrome, okay. but it may. So you have to worry about each one of these patients that when you see this, that you know in two years they're going to be like this or something really bad. But most patients, that doesn't happen. And if you talk, when I've talked to psychiatrists, 
and I show them videotapes of people like Yosef or people who have other bizarre syndromes, they'll say, I've never seen that. And it's true. They may have treated 500 or 1,000 schizophrenics, and they've never seen it. I'm the movement disorder person who sees, you know, the bad ones from the whole catchment area, you know, the whole state, and I see it. And if I show videotapes of some of these patients to other people who are movement disorder people, they won't even take, without a history, they'll say, oh, that's neuroleptic-induced. You know, they won't, they, there's virtually no differential. They, you know, they don't think this is Huntington's disease. They don't think this is stroke. They say, this is from a neuroleptic. I mean, they're very easy to identify. How do you identify those patients early on at the beginning so you know to get them off their bad drug on another drug that's presumably not going to cause it? Nobody knows.